We have the perfect guest today, ECB, maybe affecting the cost of capital, Jerome Schneider, PEMCO. Thank you. One of your key highlights, and we've been talking about it for better part of six months, seven months, cost of capital started moving up in October when central bank balance sheets started to go the other way. Instead of giving more, they were giving less. The ECB kind of changed that today. What's your theory now on how you trade with the cost of capital maybe coming back down a bit from fear levels at the end of last year? It's a great point. Investors should be focused on not only liquidity management, but also the cost of capital in nominal and real terms. What the ECB and the Fed have effectively done is stabilize the cost of capital in nominal terms. But we still have to think about it in relative terms, especially in terms of a risk-free rate here in the U.S., about 2.4%. We have to be thinking about how it affects risk asset pricing on a go-forward basis. So as a result, there's probably going to be more volatility in the market as investors digest that increased cost of capital in both real and nominal terms, focusing on those real terms over the next few months. You know, we live in a binary world, unfortunately, when it comes to investing. If the Fed talks about a pause, investors here, they're done. Next moves in ease. Okay? So when it comes to things like volatility, it's the same thing. If investors fear more volatility, their behavior changes drastically in a short period of time. They get less uh, willing to hold equities. Well, simply put, we're in an environment where we should be expecting more and more volatility along the way. And as a result, investors had to be poised to add more liquidity to their portfolios as opposed to less and be more active in terms of how they think about the deployment of risk assets and the layering of liquidity within their portfolios. Simply said, risk adjusted returns. That's what you have to think about. And having a little bit more dry powder in the form of owning short dated assets, maybe in the fixed income markets, provides a lower volatility profile to overall portfolio construct. Simply, cash might be king for a little bit while longer. You know, the 11th commandment in investing, if you like interest rates, of course. Is, is that based on the complexion of the curve, it gives you a good idea where you want to play. And if the curve is flat, why take all the risk and playing with a long end that's going to be way more whippy, so you move to the short end? That was one of your ideas nine months ago. Now, with the Fed on pause, we've seen short-dated ETFs that concentrate on those investors that have that preference, two months of outflows. Uh, is that adjustment over? Is it an opportunity? Will it continue? It's more an opportunity at this point in time. Simply, we've seen outflows as the risk assets went from rich to cheap in December, and as a result, they've recalibrated back to a fair to slightly rich level. As a result, we've seen ETF outflows uh, you know, simply happen. Over the short period of time, when you look at those short dated ETFs, some of them yield between 3 and 3.5% 3 .5 for very little amount of interest rate exposure. It's not a bad place to hide out over the next few months until we get more clarity on where the growth in the United States and around the world is going. And some of the recent economic data, as we've seen here in the U.S., isn't so bad. So we have to take a very balanced approach, and investors have to be preparing for not only the upside potential, but the downside potential. These short dated ETFs give them a good place to hide out on risk-adjusted returns. Thanks for making it sound so easy, Jerome. <laughs>